Appreciate that music tonight. Well, good evening. Great to see y'all here tonight. And I just want to say thank you so much to the Bachmans for having me over tonight. Really enjoyed uh, the meal and the fellowship. It was quite a blessing. Thank you so much. Your whole church has been very hospitable to me, and I really do appreciate that. And uh, just before uh, the preach, I did have a couple of illusions here. Let me go ahead and set this down for us. And uh, for this one here, I, uh, you know, somebody, one of the kids this afternoon told me that they were sitting by their friend. I told him I was kind of jealous because I don't have one of those. But uh, so uh, since I don't, I kind of have to make them up. So. This is, uh, oh, let me, let me work on this for a second here. This is, uh, this is my friend, um, let's see, this is my friend Bobby. This is, this is Bobby right here, and uh, Bobby is kind of an airhead, and <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? All right, and uh, we're going to see if we can attempt so Okay, forget Bobby. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me try this again. Oh, good. We can see that one better anyways. Okay. Uh, 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 now, so this is not Bobby. This one, I used to be able to tie my shoe, but I struggle sometimes doing that. All right. Get my finger out of there. Okay, good. This, oh, this is, oh, he, need, he needs a mouth. I forgot. Forgot the mouth. This one is Blobby, is who this is. And uh, Blobby is kind of like some of you, half awake, half asleep. And uh, but Blobby's gonna try something impossible here tonight. I'm gonna see if I can make Blobby to eat my finger ring. All right, you ready for this? Blobby, open up. Guess we'll have to use force. Okay, ready? Here we go. Ready? Wait a minute. I don't know if you guys can hear it in the microphone. You can hear it. Maybe you guys in the front can even see it right there. Can you guys see that down there? All right. I'll, I'll try to wave. Sometimes you can see it flash in the light too. You see it? A little bit flashing in the light. It really is inside. You can tell because the sound right there. All right now. So now we're going to see if we can make Blobby to spit the ring out through his nostril. He only has one nostril. Okay, so here you go. Ready, buddy? Bobby, or Blobby, ready? Ready? Oh, do not make me use the enforcer. Okay, ready? Okay, guess you have to use the enforcer. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the enforcer right here. Okay, here we go. So let me find that nostril. Here we go. Might want to watch your ears. Here we go. Ready? And... Wait a second. Wait just a minute. You can see piercing straight through. If you listen, you can hear the ring on the needle inside. And this is also kind of weird. Right there. Okay. All right. And just in case you wonder if the needle is sharp, there is the ring right there inside Blobby's guts, right there, <laughs> okay. So, there we go, there we go, all right. Good, good. Well, for this uh, last one here tonight, I haven't performed this last one in uh, probably a year and a half, and so uh, if it messes up, you have to laugh at me really hard, okay? Is that a deal? Okay, good, all right, so I do need a volunteer. I was thinking maybe, maybe an adult uh, that could help me out, uh, possibly a teenager, but but this one would be better for, for a non-child here. So maybe adult that wouldn't mind assisting me. It's not embarrassing, I promise. But I do need someone to, uh, to help be a uh, verification for the audience. A teen, I'll go with a teenager if, if we have a teenager that would like to. All right. All right. Give Brother Daniel a hand. Fantastic. Ah, yes. So glad he was an eager volunteer. That's great. That's great. So what I have here. Mr. Daniel, sir, you can just stand right here in the middle. I appreciate you helping me out. So what I have here is I have some needles and I have some sweet nectar from heaven, also known as Dr. Pepper. All right, that's what I have right here. So I like that you can take it and take a look at it. Just make sure there's nothing trick about that. There's no 
secret compartments or anything. All right. All right, look good. All right, and then I have some absolutely real sewing needles here. And what I want you to do is I want you to take each one and drop it inside of uh, my little vial here. And as you're dropping, I just want you to check them to make sure they really are real needles. So go ahead, you can pull, go ahead and pull them out. Make sure they're not flexible. Uh, make sure they are sharp right there, that's perfect. And so make sure they're not like rubber or spaghetti or anything like that. They really are real sewing needles. All right, there's four, I believe. And there's five, there's six, seven, eight. You can see they're dropping right in there. Nine and last one there and 10. Do they look good? All right, they were, they were real sewing needles. Is that correct? What's that? They're slowly dissolving. I, I think that's just the uh, carbonation gathering around them. All right. If they were dissolving, I need to learn that trick because that's really <laughs> cool. All right. They really are in there. And, uh, and so I have that and I also brought you something here as well. If you go ahead and turn that on, the buttons there on the end, fantastic. And uh, what I'm going to do here is something do not try this at home. <coughs> Brother Daniel, is there anything in, in this hand right here? Nothing at all. All right, this hand as well under my ring. No needles anywhere. Would you check the vial as well? Make sure the vial is empty. Nothing. Okay, okay, great. So they're not stuck in there anywhere, correct? All right. Now I'd like you, and this is a little awkward, but I'd like you to check my mouth as well, all right? <laughs> so I have a flashlight. Okay, here we go. Ready? I see one back there. <laughs> you see one? one? All right, let me help you get that one down. <laughs> Okay. All right. No, seriously. Anything above my tongue? Nothing. Anything under my tongue? Nothing. Bottom lip? Nothing. Make sure. Uh, All right. Top lip? Nothing. All right. Side of the mouth? Nothing. Right there? No. This side? No. They really are gone, right? I don't know where they went. Okay. They really are small. <laughs> Give them a hand. Thank you so much. You can turn it off and set that down right there. I appreciate that very much. And so there's some people that have a uh, particular talent uh, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what they call themselves, but you can look it up. Basically, they're kind of like re regurgitators is what they are. They will, for example, some of them will swallow a bunch of coins and they'll say, give me a number. And you'll say 47 cents. And then they'll, <coughs> they'll, they'll cough out 47 cents exactly. Now, I can't do that, uh, but I'm going to try a, a different version here tonight that I have called the human sewing machine. All right. So we got our needles there. Now we need a little bit of thread right here. It's kind of a sad way to make a living, isn't it? <laughs> Let me speed this up. All right, <coughs> all right, music please, Pastor, all right. All right. 
right. There we go. And uh, <laughs> if you wanted to, you could come touch these. These really are real sewing needles, but I don't blame you if you don't want to. All right. So appreciate it so much, Pastor. Turn it back over to you, sir. Amen. Well, great. Great music all week, very God-honoring music, and it's been a blessing to, to hear that. And I also want to say a word here uh, about the offering. I never know uh, in who gives or, or all that amount. The Lord knows that, but I just want to say I'm grateful. Thank you so much for your generosity to uh, my family and I. We really do appreciate it. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, last chapter in the book of Genesis. We're going to kind of jump right into the story here as we take a look at the, the message tonight. And we're going to pick up on the story of the man Joseph. And uh, this is uh, towards the end of his father's life. And really what's happening here in the past we're going to read is that uh, jo Joseph's dad is just going to pass away here. And his brothers are getting really nervous. They're, they're really afraid because they think this whole time the only reason that Joseph had been nice to them was because dad was still alive. But they thought, okay, now that dad's dead, now he's going to finally get his revenge. We're, we're finally going to get what we deserve for all that we've done to Joseph. And so let's see how they handle that here in Genesis chapter 50. In verse number 15, here's the word of God. It says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So if you're uh, picturing this story here, uh, Joseph's brothers are really afraid here. And so they come up with this little plan. Hey, let's go to the, our servant and have our servant go tell Joseph that dad said he needed to forgive us. You know, as kids, right, uh, whenever you put that little tag into something, hey, mom said you better stop. Uh, mom said you have to give that to me, right? So, so they say we're going to try this. Look, dad's authority behind us. So the servant goes in front of Joseph and he says, Hey, your, your dad told you that you're supposed to forgive. And, uh, and uh, then uh, right after he finishes talking, the brothers come in there and they say, Hey, uh, dad said that you need to forgive us. And then they come and they fall on their face before Joseph. Why? Because they're afraid. Uh, he's, the mo he's the second most powerful man in the world. They're very afraid. And, and so they say, uh, hey, we'll be your servants. Just, just don't kill us, please. Uh, mercy. And Joseph's response, the Bible says, Joseph weeps. He wept when they spake unto him. It's as if Joseph uh, said, guys, I, I didn't realize this, this whole time you've been afraid, thinking I'm waiting for my moment to, to drop the hammer. No, no guys, I, I, in essence, I forgave you a long time ago. Tonight, I'd like to preach to you a message I've titled, Dealing with Pain. Dealing with Pain. There's different uh, types of pain that we experience in our life. Some of the pain is kind of what I call surface pain. You know, it, I mean, it kind of hurts, but it's, it's not really a deep hurt. You know, it's not that big a deal. Uh, my, my wife grew up uh, always wanting a dog as a child. And finally, uh, uh, finally they, their family decided to get a dog. And they got this dog, a little white dog, and brought it home. And they named it Fluffy. And they realized that, that Fluffy wasn't a, a very obedient dog. And Fluffy uh, didn't seem to respond very well to the children. And they finally realized that Fluffy was deaf. <laughs> so they went back to the owners and said, hey, you, you sold us a deaf dog. And uh, they were pretty disappointed with it, but they, they decided to keep it. And, uh, and uh, when Joy told me this, I thought this was the funniest thing. I, I mean, I just had never met a deaf dog. And I mean, how do you yell at a deaf dog? <laughs> I mean, you can. It just doesn't do any good, you know. And, and I, I remember uh, they said if they wanted the dog's attention, then they would just flip the lights on and off really fast. And the dog would be like, oh, oh what's going on? And, and uh, so I, I just, I used to kind of like 
injustice kind of make fun of her death dog. You know, it, it wasn't a, a painful thing, but it maybe bothered Joy just a little bit. Well, um, sadly, uh, Fluffy uh, got hit by a car. I uh, guess she didn't hear it coming. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? That's really bad. Oh, no, but you guys aren't thinking it's funny. All right. <laughs> so, but uh, that, didn't kill, that didn't kill Fluffy. She, she died of something else. But I, I, I didn't, would kind of joke about it and kind of, you know, give her a hard time about her dog. But it wasn't that big a deal. It was kind of one of those surface pain things. But so sometimes there's that surface pain. And sometimes the pain that we experience in our lives, it runs really deep. I was on a missions trip to... Uh, to the Philippines, and I remember I was, actually went with Brother Dave Young and, and had a great trip there, got to preach the gospel, and, and uh, saw some people saved. And I remember we were traveling back the, uh, the last night, and uh, our flight was going to leave that evening, and we had about three-hour drive to go, and it started pouring down rain. And, uh, you know, the, the road system there is, is nothing like America, so it really wasn't draining well for the rain. And so it was, it was pretty deep. And we could tell the missionary was, was kind of nervous because he's trying to drive in through, this, through the rain and through the puddles there. And, and he wanted, you know, to get the, get the pastors to the, uh, or to get the evangelists to the airport on time. And so we were trying to be kind of quiet in the back seat. But Brother Young says, hey, Dave, do you have any, uh, do you have any fingernail clippers? I'm like, yeah, I got some right here in my bag. And I remember I, I reached inside my bag to pull them out. And I was like, it was like something bit me. It was, it was really weird. And reached inside again. It was even more painful the second time. I, I, I finally found them. It was kind of dark, so I couldn't see very well. And finally found them. I pulled them out and I gave them to him. And when I kind of realized what, what had happened, uh, my finger was hurting me pretty, pretty badly. And, and I remember I was able to kind of turn a light on. And, and what I realized is inside of my bag was my shaving razor uh, pointing straight up with no guard on it. And so when I reached inside and I felt something bit me, it was the blades on my shaving razor. And, uh, and uh, the intense pain was, was the nerve that was sliced on my shaving razor. I remember I pulled it out and I looked at it and, I, and, I, and I'm like, you know, again, I'm trying not to cause a scene for the missionary. And I'm like, you know, I'm like indicating the, the pain that's happening here. And, and, I, and I'm like, hey, I, I don't want to bleed on his car. Do you have something? And he, I'm hoping he had maybe a tissue. And he reached in. He's like, he's like, this is all I got. And it was an alcohol swab. Well, I didn't want to bleed on the man's car. And so I remember I opened the thing up and I put that on. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, that was, some, that was some serious pain. That was some intense pain that was happening there. And, and you see, sometimes the pain that we, that we face is, is just surface pain. But sometimes there's things that we face in our life that the pain runs very deep. And I tell you, if we don't deal with that pain properly, it will cause great damage in every aspect of our life. We'll look at that tonight. And so I want to know tonight, uh, uh, the pain that we experience, how have you dealt with it? Are you dealing with pain the proper biblical way? Joseph's pain that he experienced here, uh, the brothers even recognize in verse number 15, uh, all the evil which we did unto you. You see, one thing Joseph does not do in this passage he doesn't sugarcoat the pain. He doesn't act like, well, guys, you know, it really wasn't that big a deal. No, it was a big deal. I mean, his brothers wanted him dead. They were going to murder him. They say, you know what? Let's not murder him. Instead, how about we sell him and make money off of him? And boy, and in fact, if you look at a couple of chapters before, uh, you'll hear the, the brothers talking and, and, they, and they make this statement. They uh, talks about the, the anguish, the anguish that they heard from Joseph. And boy, that is such a, a true des description of Joseph's pain. I mean, it wasn't just, oh, that bothered me. No, he was in anguish. I mean, in this culture, family was everything, especially the, the Israelite family there. They didn't have uh, close friends. They didn't have these connections with, with other towns and other villages. So when he was rejected by his family, he was alone. I mean, he had no other human being at all uh, that time. And then, boy, the turmoil of, uh, of being dragged back to Egypt and then being sold and then uh, being, uh, becoming a slave there in Potiphar's house. And, and what a different, different attitude, what a different lifestyle it was being from dad's favorite to a privileged child to now being a slave. And, boy, just the pain that he experienced and the, the low points of his life. But what did Joseph do? Boy, he still loved God through that pain. And then he did right. He served the Lord. And, and then he was falsely accused on top of that. I mean, you talk about someone who would have a, a, a natural reason to quit. Joseph had it. I mean, man, it, it was bad. It was terrible. God, where are you in all of this? 
But Joseph didn't have that spirit. He still served the Lord. In fact, he was thrown into the prison. And in the dungeon there, the Bible says, two full years down there, forgotten about, even though he helped a couple guys out, uh, or at least one of them, uh, he forgotten about. And finally, after all that time, he was, he was brought to this point, and, and now he has all this power and all this ability to make them pay. But we don't find that as the attitude that Joseph had. How should we deal with pain? Number one, realize this, people will hurt you. Isn't that an encouraging thought here tonight? Uh, but it's just true. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 16, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. That's what Jesus said. It's impossible, but it's going to come. It will happen. If someone has not hurt you deeply, hang on. Because sooner or later, it's going to happen. But the question is, when it does, how will you respond to that? Sometimes the pain that we face is deep. Sometimes the, the pain that we face is, feels so treacherous. The, the people that we uh, trusted the most sometimes are the ones that let us down the hardest. And, and sometimes when the pain we face, it's not just a one-time deal. Sometimes it's continual. Sometimes it's, it's repeated. Jesus even said there in that passage in Luke 17, if he trespassed against thee seven times in a day. Well, the idea there is over and over and over and over and over again. How should you respond? To forgive. To forgive. Realize people will hurt you. I wonder tonight, uh, I'm not going to do it, but if I were to have you all close your eyes and, and say, how, how many of you would say that there's someone or a situation in your life that has hurt you very deeply and you were to be completely honest with you, boy, there would be memories that would flood our mind. There would be situations that we face. Sometimes if I were to say, a friend, uh, boy, that... Boy, that triggers some memories. Or if I say your brother or sister or aunt or uncle or maybe even mom or dad in some cases and some serious pain that happened. And I'll tell you, if you don't handle that, that serious pain properly, the damage that happens in your life will be great. Number one, people hurt you. Number two, realize this. There are major problems with not forgiving you see, we think this, hey, the, what they did to me was wrong. They have a big problem. They should not have done that. And you're absolutely right. I am not at all belittling that statement or acting like, oh, it wasn't that big a deal. No, it, I'm not saying that at all. Joseph never made excuses for the sin. But I will say this. If you choose not to forgive, you see, forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. And if you choose not to forgive, the person that will be hurt the most is you. Oh yeah, well I'm holding this against them. And you think that you have this power over them or this thing you're holding over their head. And that's not the case. It doesn't work that way. The person you're hurting the most is yourself. I wrote down a few things the scripture teaches. Some major problems with not forgiving. Number one, when you don't forgive, you are playing God. God says this, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Boy, when you attempt to enact vengeance or to hold someone accountable, you are trying to play God. Friend, that's a foolish thing. That's a dangerous thing. You know, let God be God. You just obey Him and choose to forgive. Because if you don't, you, you, are not, uh, you find yourself in the, taking on a role that you don't fit taking on a role that is not meant for you. You cannot play God. That's what happens when you choose not to forgive. Look at you, would you look at Matthew chapter 18? This is a familiar story about the subject of forgiveness. And in Matthew chapter 18, what we find here is a, an illustration that's given. And basically, there's, there's three people that are the main characters here. There's the, the one a master, and then this master has two servants that are kind of on equal plane. The Bible uses the term fellow servants here. And, and so one of the servants owes the master an unbelievable amount of money. I mean, his debt was so big, he could work his entire lifetime and never pay it off. And so that servant goes to the master and says, please, just, just give me some time. Have mercy. I'll pay it all back. You remember the story here? And, and here's what the Bible says in verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant, Matthew 18, 27, was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. We talk about one of the happiest days of his life. Oh, are you serious? You're just forgiving the whole thing. So I don't owe you anything. That's right. You're forgiving the debt. 
But then this fellow servant, uh, this servant goes and finds one of his fellow servants, and this guy owed him just a little bit of money. I mean, it wasn't that much. He could have paid it back if he worked at it. And the, the fellow servant came to him and said, hey, give me some time. I'll, I'll pay it all back. In fact, it's interesting, it's almost the same exact uh, verbiage that this guy said to the master. I mean, almost the same thing. But th this time, the, the servant that had been forgiven said, no, no time at all. In fact, it's too late. I'm casting you into the debtor's prison. And here's what uh, the Bible says here, verse 30. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, so some other guys around watching the whole story, they saw it was done. They were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. This master heard what happened. Then his Lord, after they had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean wicked servant? That guy owed me money. He couldn't pay. He's getting what he deserved. Yet he called him wicked. Why did he call him wicked? Because he chose not to forgive. See, unforgiveness is a wicked thing. So he says, Oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And this is when Jesus brings us home. And boy, I think this verse is a very uh, scary verse. You talk about the fear of God. Here, here it is in verse 35. So... Likewise, hey, just like that, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Well, I don't want to miss the phrase that Jesus says, if ye from your hearts. And it's one thing to say, yeah, I forgive you. Say it with your lips, because you know you should. You know, but this is not good, and you're supposed to forgive. But boy, the question is, have you forgiven from your heart? Jesus says, if you haven't, if you have not forgiven from your heart, then the same thing that happened to that guy is going to happen to you. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Now, what is he talking about? Verse 34. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. I think that is the perfect description of, of a person who's bitter, a person who refuses to forgive. I'm not forgiving. They did me wrong. I did not deserve it. There's no excuse for it. This person who chooses not to forgive is tormented. Tormented. Oh, here, here, here the, uh, the person that did the wrong walks into the room and and boy, the, the person who was offended sees them and all oh, the memories come up. You know, the blood pressure rises and the stomach turns into knots and the anger, the clenched fist, the tight jaw. And, and they're having a good old day. I mean, they basically forgot about us, not even bothering them. And boy, that hurts even more. Oh, look, look how happy they are too. Oh, you're tormented. You're tormented. When you don't forgive, number two, God must punish you. That's what Jesus said. Hey, just like the Lord had to punish that servant, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. God must punish you. Why? Because unforgiveness is a sin. It is a sin that is a damaging, dangerous sin. It is a sin that, boy, really causes torments in your life. Friend, you don't want that. You don't want the torment that comes from unforgiveness. No, release the person. Let them go. Choose to forgive. We don't forgive. God must punish you. Number three, when you don't forgive, God won't answer your prayers. God won't answer your prayers. In Psalm 66, verse 18, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity, regard has any hold on to, if I regard iniquity in my heart, well, when you hold on to that bitterness, you hold on to that unforgiveness. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And friend, are you having trouble uh, having God answer your prayers? Are you having trouble uh, getting through to heaven? Perhaps it is because there's some bitterness in your heart. In fact, in Mark chapter 11, Jesus very closely relates the concept 
of forgiveness and prayer. They are hand in hand. Even in the, the model prayer that God gives, he speaks of, hey, forgiveness. Well, the forgiveness ought to be a regular part of your prayer life. In Mark chapter 11, verse number 25, here's what the Bible says, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any. Well, I'm only going to forgive the people who I like. No. If you're going to pray, if you're going to stand there praying before God, forgive if you have aught. Uh, we mentioned that word the other day. That ought is, there's something there. There's, there's a situation there. There's a, there's a bitterness there. There's a, a burr in this saddle, if you want to call it that. If there's ought, uh, if you have ought against any, why? That your heavenly Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Wait, don't you want God to be close to you? Don't you want God to answer your prayer? Don't you want to enjoy living in the forgiveness of God? Then you must choose to forgive. If you uh, don't forgive, then God won't answer your prayers like he wants to. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Some people think, well, Brother Dave, this is just between me and them. All right? Doesn't affect anything else. Th that person did me wrong. We have an understanding. We've got our distance here. It's just between us. It doesn't really affect the other areas of my life. That's incredibly unbiblical. It's not true at all. Look what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says. Looking diligently. The idea, hey, hey pay, pay attention. Look diligently. Watch out. Looking diligently. Why? Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, read those words carefully. God's grace is not what fails here. God's grace is not what's failing. It's a man that's failing of the grace of God. What do you mean? Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You see, when you choose not to forgive, when there's unforgiveness in your heart, that's where that root of bitterness begins. And that bitterness is there in your heart. And the Bible says that that bitterness troubles you. Similar idea to the story, tormented. Well, have you met someone who's like that? I've met people who I'm just like, man, I, you can just sense that there's unforgiveness in their heart. The way they speak about people and the, the, the view they had towards God and the view they had towards the church and the view they had towards other people. There's, there's unforgiveness that's there. When you have a root of bitterness in your heart, it troubles you. You don't want to, that trouble in your life. You don't want that at all. My question is, does it stop there? Is it truly just between you and them? Not according to this verse. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You see, you cannot compartmentalize bitterness. No, it is a, it's been said bitterness is the only poison that eats up its own container. It really is. It eats you up from the inside. And boy, it spills out. It troubles you, but it doesn't stay there. It spills out into the other relationships in your life. Uh, maybe your, your parent treated you a certain way. You vow, I'm never going to treat my child like that. And all of a sudden you find yourself doing the same thing. You think, man, what am I doing? I hate it when they did that to me. And it, well, could it be there's some bitterness there? and You haven't dealt with that. So now it's defiling the other relationships in your life. Uh, you, you find uh, uh, coming out against your children and coming out towards your friends. And uh, I tell you, sometimes what happens, and sometimes in, in a church, maybe someone has been to a previous ministry. Church, listen carefully tonight. There's sometimes that people have been to a previous ministry and there has been some real hurt that's taken place. Whether it be from a preacher, whether it be from other church members, and there's some real pain that's happened, and you've left that church, but you haven't dealt with the bitterness, and you, you come to this church, and you think, well, that's just the other church, but what happens is uh, you can't compartmentalize it. It troubles you, and thereby many be defiled. And you're always second-guessing the decisions of this church and always uh, uh, not trusting people and, and doubting the pastor's vision and his goals. And, and boy, there's, just this, there's an attitude there. And you think, well, you know, it's my role to, to, to watch over them to make sure they're doing things right. And the whole thing really is just some bitterness, some unforgiveness from the past. Oh, friend, let it go. Don't carry that baggage into this ministry. Man, ask God to help you. Lord, help me forgive 
help me forgive. When you don't forgive, realize this, many more people will be hurt. Not just a few. That verse says, many be defiled. I'm telling you, what, what is your point for the day? My point is this. It's in your best interest to forgive. It's in your best interest. This is going to help you out the most to choose to forgive. And here's the fifth one I wrote down. And this one to me is, is a pretty scary thing. Would you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2? Paul makes a statement here that, I mean, he kind of says it in passing, but boy, it's a pretty strong thing, a pretty strong warning that we need to realize that we're all in danger of happening to as well. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 10, he's speaking of forgiveness here. And, and I really, I love the King James and the wording of it. And uh, let's, let's read the verse, 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 10. He says, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Uh, he says, hey, if you guys thought that you had to forgive, man, I really had to forgive. And that's what he says there. He says, uh, uh, I, I forgave too. And he said, and then he, he gives us a secret on how he did that, which I'm not going to uh, park on just yet. But he, he says there, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Maybe say, Brother Dave, I, I tried to forgive, but I can't. You're right. You're right. Well, I tried to let it go, and I just can't. You're exactly right. Even Paul admitted the same. He said, you know how I forgave them? It wasn't in my person. It wasn't in me. My flesh profiteth nothing. I couldn't do it. He says, uh, forgave I it in the person of Christ. It was through the person of Jesus Christ that I was able to forgive. It was through the strength of Jesus Christ. It was through the power of Jesus Christ that I was able to forgive. But then the very next verse tells us if he would not have done that, if Paul would not have allowed God to do that forgiving work in his life, if he would have refused to forgive, if he would not have depended upon God's power to help him forgive, Paul, what would have happened to you? Listen to what he says in verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. The Bible speaks of the wiles of the devil. The word here, devices, a similar thought there. And, and see, Satan has devices that he likes to use. Satan is, is, is not dumb. Satan has, is, is good at what he does. And he has plans to ruin your life. He is that roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And one of his favorite devices to use is bitterness, is bitterness. Paul said, if I would have held on to that bitterness, if I would have kept that unforgiveness in my heart, this is what I would have done. I would have been giving Satan advantage of me. That word advantage means to put someone or something superior in your life. He said, if I would not have forgiven, I would have had Satan have authority and victory. And one of the words the Bible talks about is ground or place. If, if you think of like a, your mind like a battlefield and there's ground, like, like an army taking over a battlefield and, and areas and countries, your mind is that way. And he says, I would be putting Satan victorious in some areas of the battlefield of my mind. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place, similar idea, you have to give place to the devil. When you don't forgive, realize this, you open the door for direct satanic attack and victory. You are saying, Satan, I'm going to give you victory over an area of my life. Do you want that? Do you want Satan to have authority and victory in your life? I promise you, you don't. But if you choose not to forgive, that's exactly what you're doing. You are giving Satan advantage of you. The reason I went through these problems tonight is I'm trying to tell you it is in your best interest to forgive. Number one, people will hurt you. Number two, there are major problems when you choose not to forgive. And number three, I want to give you a plan to help forgive. I want to give you a plan to help forgive. And, and if, if you were going to talk to me and counsel with me about forgiveness afterwards, here's some of the, the steps that I would encourage you to take. And, 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 I, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to, I want to encourage you throughout these steps. The whole key is in the person of Christ, in the person of Christ, not in your strength, 
in the person of Christ. One of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for thee, for uh, my strength, uh, for thy strength is made perfect in weakness. In weakness. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. He says, I'm weak. I have infirmities, but I'm glad I have those. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, Brother Dave, I'm weak. I am struggling forgiving. I'm having a hard time doing it. That's good. What? That's good. Man, I feel like quitting. No, no, don't quit. Realize weakness is good. Because now that you're weak, now finally you can see God's strength through you. Paul says uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Man, I like that. Don't you want the power of Christ to rest upon you? Don't you want Jesus Christ in his person to give you victory over in your life? If you want the power of Christ to rest upon you in the area of forgiveness, then I encourage you, quit trying to do it on your own. Quit looking to yourself. Quit trying, well, I'll just, I'll just try harder. No, Christian life is not about trying harder. It's about depending upon Christ and watching God do things through you. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is not something that you make up. Oh, I'm just going to try to love them more. I'm just going to try to be more patient. I mean, it's hard. I can't stand them, but I'm going to try. No, no. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's something God does. It's something God produces in your heart. Uh, it, love, joy, peace, long suffering, all that comes when God does that work. You must learn what it means to stop trusting in yourself and start depending upon Christ doing that work in you. So what are some steps we can take to see God do that? Number one, decide to forgive. Begins with a decision. As I mentioned the story yesterday about the couple that argued and went into their doors and they just kind of ignored it, that is not the way you deal with it. Jesus Christ did not ignore your sin. Jesus didn't pretend it never happened. No, Jesus forgave it. He, he dealt with it. He confronted it on the cross. He bore your sin. He said, all right, it is finished. He took care of it. Decide to forgive. When Joseph talked to his brothers, he wept. He was like, guys, in essence, I forgave you a long time ago. Number one, decide to forgive. I remember being in, uh, in grad school, and one of the students there kind of interrupted the professor in a conversation about forgiveness, and he said, oh, you're only supposed to forgive if they ask you. Well, that's a very humanistic philosophy. You don't find that in the Word of God. We read the verse already. If any uh, man have ought against any, if you have ought against any, not just uh, if you have ought against someone who uh, has already asked to forgive you. No, if there's any ought at all, there's any unforgiveness, we choose to forgive whether they ask you or not. Number two, back in our text in Genesis chapter 50, look at verse 19. The Bible says this, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Number two, dedicate the situation to God. What is a plan to, to help you forgive? Boy, in your heart, you have to dedicate the situation to God. And I think sometimes that happens to happen re repeatedly. Sometimes it needs to happen every time the memory comes up. Every time you begin to rehash it in your mind, once again, dedicate to God. He says this, he says, I'm in the place of God. This is where God had me. If you look at Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, Joseph says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God is sending me before you to preserve life. Hey, you hurt me, but let me tell you this, guys. God was bigger than this. God is bigger than the situation, and so I'm going to give this to him. I'm going to let God be God. I'm going to quit correcting God, quit saying, God, why did you allow this? And God, you shouldn't have done this, and what you should have done was this. No, I'm going to put God in his rightful place. God, you are God. I am not, and I'm going to dedicate this to you. Because sometimes the bitterness that's in our hearts may not be directed towards an individual. It may be directed towards the Lord. God, why did you allow this sickness? God, why did you allow this job loss? Why did you allow this financial disaster? Why did you do that? And friend, I don't have all the answers for why, but I do know God. And I do know that the God of this Bible is good. 
And he only does good. And the things that he does in your life, uh, we have to remember, this isn't heaven yet. This isn't heaven yet. This is not a perfect place yet. This is still a sin-cursed world. And so instead of blaming God, instead of getting mad at God, it's not God's fault that there's sin here. Mankind is the one who chose the sin. We are the ones who, who have brought sin into this world. And so I will say this, uh, God, as Romans 8 says, God can work all things together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to this purpose. What you need to do is cast it on Him. Maybe someone needs to say, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to quit trying to figure it all out. I'm going to quit demanding answers. I think we have to be very careful how we ask God questions. That's one thing to say, God, you know, what are you doing here? Or God, what, what are you trying to teach me? It's a whole other thing to say, God, why did you do this? Why did you allow this? There's a whole different heart in that type of talking to the Lord. And it's okay to ask God questions. And I know sometimes there's pain. When we, when we read David, talk to the Lord in the book of Psalms, we, we, we hear the pain come out. And, you know, it's, it's good to talk things through with the Lord. But even if you do go through those painful questions before God, when you come to the end of it, you have to say, God, I don't know these answers. And maybe I never will. But, God, you are good. And I will love you. And I will serve you. And, God, I'm going to dedicate this situation to you. Oh, friend, I'll tell you, that will help you so much. There will be a burden. I remember talking to a teenager uh, a while back about, he said, man, I didn't even realize how bitter I was against my dad. He said, tonight I got things right, and boy, I already feel a weight lifted off. I really feel a joy that's come. Why? Because, boy, I've given this to the Lord, and I've decided to forgive, and I've dedicated the situation to the Lord. Number three, in our uh, story here, notice what Joseph does. See, Joseph doesn't just say, all right, guys, I forgive you, but you know what? You stay on that side of Goshen. Don't come into Egypt. You, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. I really don't want to see you guys. No, that's not the way Joseph dealt with it. No, listen to what he says. Now, therefore, verse 21, now, therefore, fear ye not. Why do he say that? Because they were terrified. <laughs> they were afraid. They're speaking to Joseph here. They're speaking to the, the man with the power here, the man that has literally saved a known world. Uh, guys, calm down. Don't be afraid. Why? I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What a man of God. What a man who had forgiven from the heart. From the heart. Have you forgiven from the heart, like Matthew 18, 35 says. Number three, do good to them. Do good to them. You know, maybe your heart has a hard time forgiving someone. Your heart has a hard time being close to someone again. And I want to challenge you, don't give up on that. In fact, do good to them. There's someone who uh, had hurt my wife and I uh, pretty deeply uh, early on in our marriage. And one of the things we try to do, we, we try to buy them a very expensive financial gift. Why? Because the Bible says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And in our heart, I was trying to apply this principle of, of not only am I going to, uh, instead of wanting revenge or vengeance, no, I want the opposite. Lord, I want you to bless them. And in fact, I will try to participate in that blessing of them and I'll buy them a gift there. And uh, boy, do good to them. Replace that bitterness with tenderhearted kindness. This is not exactly what Ephesians 4.32 says. We'll just sort of replace that bitterness and be kind, tender-hearted, not hard-hearted, not vengeful, but kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. Boy, help us tonight. Do good to them. Maybe there's someone tonight that, that you, you've been at odds with, for a while, odds with for a while, and you need to reach out to them. And you need to do good to them. And, and as you do it, you're doing it in faith and saying, God, I, I'm just trying to apply your word. God, I'm just trying to love them unconditionally. You know, love, only true biblical love is unconditional. It's not, okay, I love you because of what you've done for me. Or I love you if you treat me well. I love you if you do. No, unconditional means there's no conditions. There's, there's nothing that you have to do. I'm just going to love you. That's the love that God has for you. There's, you did not deserve it. You did not earn it. You did not merit it. God just says, I love you. And then we love him because he first loved us. We respond to God's love. And that's the same love that we're supposed to have one towards another. I'm going to love you unconditionally. and Well, I'm going to do good to you and do what I can, Lord. Help me to replace that bitterness 
with tender-hearted kindness. And finally, number four. Would you look at Colossians chapter 3? Colossians 3 here, this verse is my favorite verse on the subject of forgiveness. And boy, I hope it will be a, a help to you tonight. Colossians 3 and verse number 13. Here's what the Bible says. Colossians 3 and verse number 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Uh, who exactly are you supposed to forgive? He tells us in this verse, if any man have a quarrel against any. Hey, that, that, that's, that's everything, all right? There, there's there's no, no one's excluded from this forgiveness. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Boy, how did Christ forgive? Christ was falsely accused. Christ was uh, ridiculed and shamed and, and boy, his, his face was disfigured and he was beaten beyond recognition, the Bible teaches in Isaiah 53. And he was whipped and he was spit upon and he was lied about and the cat of nine tails tore into his flesh as he was uh, tortured for things he did not do. And after all of that, they made him carry his cross and they got to the top of the hill and they nailed his hands and his feet onto the cross. And as he's hanging on the cross and his, his back is rubbing against that wood, he is in agony. And what were Jesus' first words on the cross? Father, destroy these wicked people. He would have been justified in saying that. He would have had the right to do that. If anyone, he had the authority to cast that judgment. But see, that's not his heart. His first words on the cross were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wait a minute, they, knew, they were experts at what they were doing. They were experts at torture. They knew what they were doing. Even on the cross, tortured, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Bible says, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I remember watching, I, I was attending a message where my friend was preaching on forgiveness. And I remember a girl sat right here, I think it was in the second row, right on the end of the aisle. The whole message, her arms were folded, literally, visibly shaking her head. I mean, man, some people, if they're not going to follow the preaching, they kind of hide it. Not her, man. She, she was visibly, no, I am not going to forgive. I refuse. And then my heart breaks for that decision. Why? Because the person she's hurting the most is her. She's hurting herself the most. Boy, she's hurting her own prayer life. She's pulling away from God. No, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I wonder tonight, what's holding you back from going to that next level for the Lord? Is there some bitterness? Is there some baggage of bitterness from a previous ministry? Oh man, leave it at the altar tonight. Leave it at the nail-pierced feet of Christ saying, God, I'm going to roll this off onto you. I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to stop carrying this around. I mentioned my pastor's name is Pastor Johnny Pope. And uh, years ago, uh, before my family even moved to Texas, the, the church went through a, a, a terrible split. And really what happened was the uh, pastor's assistant at the time uh, led the split. And uh, boy, it was just a, a wicked, terrible thing. And, and uh, in fact, pastor said he remembers being in his office when there were uh, 50 letters of transfer. He had to write 50 families that left his church uh, in one day. He said after they left, he said, literally, I, I threw up. I mean, this was his life's work. This was, man, the, the church he'd labored at for, for decades and, and the betrayal and the, and the, the false ac accusations and, boy, just uh, not even giving him the benefit of the doubt or giving him an answer. And boy, just ripping the church in half and causing all kinds of problems. And I remember Pastor talking about battling bitterness in that situation. And he said, you know what I, you know what I learned to do? He said, he said, every day. When I would wake up and I would think about the situation, he said, I would just go to God in prayer and say, God, would you help me forgive? It is in the person of Christ that Paul says. So his prayer, Lord, would you help me forgive? Lord, you know what they've done. You know the pain that they've caused. God, would you help me? He said every day he prayed that the burden got a little bit lighter. For him, it didn't vanish overnight, but it got lighter. And next morning he prayed and it got a little bit lighter. And next morning, he, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter until uh, 
Years later, that assistant uh, visited our church on a Wednesday night. I mean, everyone in the church is like, are you kidding me? I mean, that's the guy that caused all the problems. And what is he doing here? And God had helped Pastor Pope to forgive so much that when he saw him there in that service, he said, hey, brother, it's, it's good to see you. Would you come close our service in prayer? I think about it, and that wasn't a show. That was, he had truly forgiven from the heart. Forgive from the heart. I wonder tonight, do you need to forgive from the heart? I know you don't need to forgive God, but maybe there's something that you need to dedicate to him from the heart. God, from the heart, I'm giving this to you. Uh, Lord, uh, from the heart, I'm going to forgive my mom. From the heart, I'm going to forgive my dad. From the heart, I'm going to forgive that ministry or, or whatever the situation is. God, I do not want to go through my life with this bitterness. Lord, just like you forgave me, I want to forgive others. God, help me me forgive. You know, if this message doesn't make sense to you tonight, perhaps it is because you've never been forgiven. You've never experienced the complete, total forgiveness that comes from Christ. Friend, if you've never been saved, Jesus is waiting. That unconditional love is waiting to forgive all of your sins. And when He forgives, he forgives every sin you've ever done. He forgives every sin you haven't even done yet. That's the love that he has. And maybe someone tonight, you need that forgiveness yourself. You have bitterness towards others, but boy, the first thing you need is to be able to have the power of God to help you forgive. And that's going to begin with your salvation. He isn't going to begrudgingly forgive you. He is waiting to eagerly forgive you. He is excited, waiting. He delights in showing mercy. He wants to forgive you. But you have to take the step. You have to be the one to say, you know what, Lord, I need to be saved. I need you to forgive me. And Lord, I need you to work in my heart so that, Lord, then the rest of my life, I won't have to be struggling with the consequences of unforgiveness. Choose to forgive. Let's stand to our feet tonight with our eyes closed and the instrumentalists make their way to the instruments tonight. With your eyes closed tonight, I wonder, would, would someone tonight be, be honest about your life and just answer this question for me? How many of you would say, Brother Dave, there is some, some pain in my life that, that I need God to help me forgive? Or there's some pain that has occurred in my life, maybe recently or maybe in the distant past, but there is some pain in my life that I need God's help to help me forgive. If that's you tonight, with your eyes closed, would you raise your hand? And I need God's help. I need God's help. I don't want to hold on to this baggage. Man, God bless you. You can take your hands down. There's hands all over the room. Somebody else. And the, I, I need God to help me with this. I can't do this. And I want God to help me. I don't want to be a bitter person. But if that's you tonight, would you come pray about that? Would you come dedicate this to the Lord? Would you, would you, maybe sometimes you need to come and out loud, you need to tell the Lord, God, I'm deciding to forgive mom. God, I'm deciding to forgive. Maybe it's your child. I don't know who it is, but Lord, I'm choosing to forgive. Take that first step and ask God to help you. Ask God, help me, Lord, help me to commit to daily asking you for help and tell this pain, uh, this burden of unforgiveness and bitterness is gone. The piano is going to begin as the piano begins. Maybe someone needs to slip out of your seat. You need to come kneel at the altar tonight and you need to experience some revival and say, Lord, I need your help. God, I don't want to be bitter. I don't want my spouse to, to be married to someone who's bitter. I don't want my kids to, to have a mom who are or a dad who's bitter. Uh, man, I don't want my friends to to see me as a bitter person. No, Lord, I need your help. God, I decide to forgive. So Lord, would you help me to put that into action? I'll tell you what a phenomenal decision. Don't give Satan authority in your life. Don't give him an advantage in your life. Decide to forgive. Maybe there's someone here tonight that you'd say, David, I need that forgiveness. Brother Dave, I need to be saved. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. And tonight, I need to receive Christ as my Savior. Friend, if that's you tonight, with your eyes closed, if you need to be saved, God's been speaking to your heart these days, and you need to be saved with your eyes closed, would you raise your hand? 
But if I need to be saved, I don't know that I'm going to heaven. I need that forgiveness in Christ. I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Just slip your hand up tonight. Anyone like that at all, just raise your hand up. If you need to be saved tonight, would you walk out of your seat, walk down the aisle, come right here to Brother Riffle and take you over to the side. He'll show you or find someone to show you how to be saved. But don't leave this place without being forgiven. But if someone else needs to come tonight to pray about forgiveness, to, to say, God, I, I refuse to live with bitterness. Lord, help me to do that. I encourage you to come as I turn it over to Pastor.